I try to keep my distance from partisan politics, but it's getting harder and harder, especially in an election season, because I know in my mind that uh, the things the candidates are saying are crafted and researched by polling numbers, and the world has always been a mess, but this year feels a little bit different. With the way things have been the, the last couple months, it's not a surprise. We've had COVID, racial temp tensions, violence in the streets, mixed with our everyday problems of sickness, disease, broken marriages, broken homes, the list goes on and on and on, and it's impossible to discern what is our part in the solution. With the differing voices that are out there, they're saying, should, what should we do? How should you help? Should we post more on social media? Should we post less on social media? Should we go support this organization? Does it focus on biblical truth and justice? Where do I begin? Now, what if I told you that you could know what our world needs and actually start acting on it? What if the blueprint for how you can impact the world is right in front of you and it actually applies to all of us right here and now? And what if it begins with ourselves? And what are we going to, and what we're going to see today in Jonah is that if you're going to make an impact in the world, you are going to have to be a light. You are going to have to model true gospel change in yourself from the inside out to truly have an impact. This is difficult. In fact, it's impossible. This is something that we cannot do on our own. I can't do on my own. But thank God we have the Bible that speaks to these things and particularly in Jonah. We're looking at this uh, today because we're in a series on Jonah and we're in chapter three. But before we get into the text in a moment, I want to share a couple things with you. First, um, this new version of our on-demand service is streamlined to get our community, the news and Bible teaching directly to you while we continue our work on the live stream service. But the live stream or in-person service is where we want you to be. Starting next week, we'll be having two services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sundays. So please stay tuned while we share this weekend highlight announcement. In, in this time of COVID, our need for connection might be greater than ever. And this is one of the ways that we do that. Also stay tuned to the weekly fog after the sermon so you can celebrate some of the ways we're making an impact in our world as a church body. So check it out. Hey Five Oaks family, Jonathan here. Uh, in this season, all of us are figuring out uh, new rhythms and uh, many of them are being done in ways that they have never been done before. And here's the thing, I know that you want encouragement and a place to just be real as you try to follow Jesus in all areas of life. We all, we all need this. And so this fall, I'd like to invite you to be a part of a small group where you can be encouraged, where you can be real and follow Jesus together in a way that you couldn't on your own. And I invite you just to try it out. We, we have a new series starting at the end of September that runs for just eight weeks. And I just say, try out a group for just those eight weeks and see how God uses that to help you feel more loved and help you follow him more closely. And also, I bet, God will use you to be a blessing to the other people in the group too. So come join a group on our website. See you guys. We are in our fifth week in our Jonah series and lots has happened in the story of Jonah. One of the quickest ways that we can review this is by watching a portion of the Bible Project video on Jonah. The story opens as God addresses Jonah and commissions him to go preach against the evil and injustice in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, Israel's bitter enemy. But instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction, finding a ship going as far west as you can go to Tarshish. Now the big question here is why? Why does Jonah run? Is he afraid? Does he just not like Ninevites? And we're not told yet. So the man of God tries to run from God, and he boards a ship full of pagan sailors. He goes down into the ship, and then he falls asleep. So God sends a huge storm to wake up his prophet, while ironically the sailors above board are wide awake to everything that's happening. They can discern that there's a divine power at work here. So they throw the dice, and they discover that Jonah, he is the culprit. 
So they ask Jonah to explain himself, and Jonah spouts off a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. He says, yeah, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the dry land. What a joke, right? God made the sea and the dry land all right, and Jonah's dumb enough to run from this God by getting on a boat? And when the sailors ask Jonah what they should do, he says, kill me, right, by throwing me overboard, which kind of seems noble at first until you realize this could actually be his most selfish move yet. I mean, what better way to avoid going to Nineveh? So he puts his blood on these innocent sailors' hands by trying to force them to kill him. They're reluctant, of course, and they repent to God even as they toss him over. The storm subsides, and they end up fearing the God of Israel, and unlike Jonah, they actually worship God. But God foils Jonah's plans to escape Nineveh. As Jonah's sinking, God provides this strange, watery tomb for him, the stomach of a large fish. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, this would be certain death. But in this story, everything's upside down. And so Jonah's submarine death becomes his passage back to life. Cramped in the stomach of this beast, Jonah utters a prayer, where he never technically says that he's sorry, but he does thank God for not abandoning him, and he promises that he will obey God from this point on, no matter what. And God's response is quite comic. The whale vomits Jonah back onto dry land. So once again, God commissions Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah complies. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city it would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in, and here is his message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now, his sermon is very short, and it's also odd. I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong, or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. So God forgives the Ninevites, and he doesn't bring destruction on the city. Now, here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. Here's Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw that they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. We're going to look at three ingredients for making lasting change and lasting impact today. These three ingredients are are missing in the political partisan solutions, but they're central in the Bible. What we get today in society is often a strong mix of stuff that ends up making a mess and dividing people even more than they already are. 
And usually it, it always adds to the problem. It reminds me of one of the YouTube videos that uh, Kyler and I shot for the youth this summer. Um, like most ministries, uh, this year was different. We had to pivot what we were doing in ministry and we had to go online. Now we're not professional YouTubers, but we created a weekly YouTube youth group and, and Zoom to keep students engaged with the ministry, with their leaders, and with God's word. Now, this is probably something that happened to everybody, but after a while, like everything else, there was Zoom fatigue, there was online platform fatigue, so we did literally everything short of setting ourselves on fire to keep things interesting. Um, but one week we did decide to make uh, smoothies for each other. And in these smoothies, there were a bunch of random foods. We had like a meat, a sweet, a liquid, a veggie, a fruit, something like that. It was gross. I tried to get the worst things I could find and Kyler, unsurprisingly, was more thoughtful. He found this thing called a rutabaga, which is, it looked like my head, so he decided to use that. And sure enough, it was absolutely terrible. And we threw up on live YouTube. And it took a while to get recover from that, from that taste and that texture and everything else that went into this creation. So we thought, you know, what better than to show you a clip from this infamous video. Check this out. So we're gonna stir this concoction. His is chunky. <laughs> yours is, is smooth. Yeah, so yours I really is... appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta swallow it. I can't. No, you, you no. have to. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> you have to swallow it. No, I you're... can't. No, you're... I just. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What our world often offers for making an impact and seeking solutions is a lot like that video. We throw in one political idea with this person's story, you put in a little guilt, some violence, put your money here, spend your time doing this, and we wonder why things are getting worse and worse. And it's getting worse because our world is missing the most important ingredient. So what are the three ingredients for making a lasting impact? Remember, we start with ourselves and then we can humbly point others to those same ingredients. Now the first ingredient that it takes to make an impact is to practice repentance. Jonah had to repent from running from God before he could preach repentance to the Ninevites. Repentance by definition is turning from sin and rebellion against God and evil. We all participate in sin, we all participate in rebellion and evil, we're all part of the problem. But for some reason, we're surprised when others repent. Sometimes we see people as being too far gone. Or like Jonah, secretly in our hearts, we don't want them to repent. Or maybe we don't care if they repent because then we'd have to forgive them. Someone's surprising readiness to repent is illustrated from an outlier in the Me Too movement. Now usually in the Me Too movement, when accusations have been made, there's usually denial or excuses. If there's confessions, it's usually excused, appealing to some kind of addiction, or even when there's repentance, there's no forgiveness. But this story is a little bit different. Now, maybe you've heard of him, his, his name is Dan Harbin. He's a, he's a writer, producer, and actor. He's done a lot of things uh, like Community and some other major shows, but he got in some trouble on the set of Community. A woman he had a crush on didn't reciprocate, so he made her life horrible. He later said on a podcast, I crushed on her and I resented her for not reciprocating. It made the, the entire time I was writing her paychecks and control whether she stayed or went and whether she felt good about herself or not and said horrible things. Harmon said, just treated her cruelly, pointedly things that I would never and would never have done if she had been a male and if I had never had those feelings for her. I never did it before and I'll never do it again, but I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it if I had any respect for women. 
be concluded a day after the podcast airs. Uh, and Gans took to Twitter the woman who he offended, saying that he accepted, she accepted Harmon's apology and forgave him. People are sometimes more willing to look deep into their hearts than we might predict, just like the Ninevites. But the gospel of Jesus and Jonah's story shows us that we have to lead the way in practicing repentance. You can't have lasting change and impact without repentance. And it's not just one of those one-time repentant heart for our sins and go to heaven kind of things. It is an ongoing rooting out of thoughts, behaviors, and actions getting in the way, that are getting in the way of our, where our hearts were created before God. Repentance restores our relationship with God that is distorted by sin. And if we want to make a lasting impact in this world, we need to understand true repentance. Joel, another prophet for the nation of Judah, is speaking to God's people about true repentance and a restored relationship with God in chapter 2, 12 and 13 of Joel. He says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he, re and he relents from sending calamity. Now this passage gives us a blueprint for true gospel-centered repentance and what that looks like. First, Joel says, rend your hearts. That means real repentance is inward. When he says, rend your hearts, he's saying, tear your hearts. He's not warning us, or he is warning us to not make repentance a show, a merely outward gesture. Don't just use words. Sin should lead to a broken heart. Now, this sounds strange and weird, but having a broken heart is a gift from God. It is a gift because it wakes us up to the reality of what our sin does to our relationship with God and with others. Sin is deeper than we think. As one pastor puts it, we can view sin as a failure of performance rather than a failure of intimacy. The only grief we experience is disappointment in our ability to do what is right and not that we have despised the living God. Our sin shows we don't trust God is good enough to sustain us, to give us joy and peace. Instead, we look to it in ourselves and other things. Our sin isn't just against one another, but against our God. However, we don't stay there with a broken heart. Lastly, we behold God's glory. Our hearts can't remain broken because our sin has already been paid for in Christ. Our sin has been nailed to the cross, defeated through his resurrection. Through Christ, we're free of guilt, shame, and fear. We have the opportunity to fully experience a compassionate, loving, and gracious God. This kind of deep repentance is life-changing. It makes God big and his glory and goodness are magnified as we repent and our guilt and shame of our sin is destroyed. What if repentance became a central part of our life? Think of the impact that you could have if you had a big God without shame and guilt. Think of the freedom to make an impact in your city and in a light to the world that you would be. Jonah preached repentance and the people of Nineveh unexpectedly responded positive, positively to his message. But as we'll, we will see in, in our next point, repentance is not enough. It's only one step of the equation. The second ingredient is to walk in faith. Repentance is turning from sin. Faith is turning to God. As we'll see in the next chapter, this outcome upsets Jonah. His faith is in his nation and his performance, but not in God. But the same may be said of Nineveh. They repented, but they didn't practice repentance. And they never entered into a covenant relationship with God by putting their faith in him. In fact, Nineveh was still overthrown years later because they didn't have true repentance that leads to life with God. They didn't continue to turn from their evil ways. The missing ingredient is faith, a faith that can only come through following God's word. This is a warning to Jonah, this is a warning to Israel, and this is a warning to us today. Now, if you've ever read Hebrews 11, it is known as the Hall of Faith. The writer of Hebrews highlights a bunch of imperfect people following God's word, even though it may have seemed crazy, even though they couldn't see what the outcome would be. They put their faith in God. 
We're going to read about Abraham here in 11, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Our hope goes so far beyond comfort, wealth, and success. Our hope is in the kingdom of God where Jesus is king. Heart-rendering repentance only makes sense in light of God's kingdom. True justice only makes sense in light of his kingdom. We must look towards the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now we got repentance, true repentance. We have true faith. But we have one more ingredient to making a lasting impact. We need to pursue biblical justice. Repentance, faith, and justice, they're inextricably linked. But this often is confused in our culture. What is justice? What does it justice mean, for example, for the woman Dan Harmon treated terribly? Is it canceling him, a Twitter apology, sensitivity training? When these problems come up, our world doesn't have an answer. Justice can only come from a heart of repentance before God and walking in faith with God. The reason Jonah was sent to Nineveh was because of the extreme violence and injustice the Ninevites inflicted on themselves and also the surrounding nations. One of the interesting things about this passage comes in verse 5. In verse 4 it says, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Verse 5 says, The Ninevites believed in God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Now, if you notice there, even before the government got involved, justice rolled through the city from the greatest to the least, meaning the the rich people uh, violence against the poor, the poor's violence against the rich, the middle class taking advantage of each other. When it comes to justice, we all have a part to play in it. But far too often, this aspect of gospel ministry gets confused with right versus left politics. The right ends up, they tend to focus on truth when it comes to justice and repentance. If you just get the right amount of truth, it will produce justice, it will produce repentance. It's focused on truth. The left will often pursue justice and repentance by setting up social programs in our cities in order to prevent injustice at the expense of truth. They, they all about doing instead of actually seeking repentance and change. And in a morally relativistic society, truth, justice, and repentance, goodness, and beauty, they're a constantly moving target. You're a hero today, canceled tomorrow. Instead of working together, the right and the left, they talk past each other, becoming more divided, more ineffectual. We aren't created to have our ideologies to be our moral compass. The city is desperate for true justice to be done. True justice that is faithful, humble, and way beyond political posturing. And only we, as God's people, can point people to true repentance, to true faith that begins to permeate our lives, our laws, and our institutions. Not just individuals. God is the God of justice. We look at Jeremiah uh, 29.7, when Judah was carried into exile, God didn't just care about his people, he cared about all the people. It says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Isaiah 1.17 says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of of the widow. Proverbs 31 says, speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. We're not calling for our governments to become theocracies. This is a message for God's people. Listen to this quote. Any church 
that does not exist to take the side of the poor, to denounce injustice, and to hold up righteousness is a church that has no right to exist. Now, this is not a tweet from some social justice warrior. This was written by a 19th century English Puritan preacher, Charles Spurgeon. It's probably written with a quill and ink. Throughout all of scripture, we see that God is a God of justice. We want our kids to know God. We want them to learn about God, to put God's word in our hearts, but oftentimes that's where it ends. And it ends there sometimes because our lives are busy. It's difficult to know where to go or how to pursue actual justice in our cities. But we want to be the kind of church that exists to take up the side of the poor, that denounces injustice and holds up the righteous. You are the church. So let's pursue justice and repentance and faith together. And we can actually do that. Now, I don't know if you guys all remember, uh, over a year ago, the Impact Passport that we launched. The passport simply gives a tangible way for you and your family to serve our city in various ways at various levels. Over the next three weeks or, or three months, we want to point you and your family towards different opportunities and organizations that are doing good work for the poor, the immigrant, and the world so that you can be part of doing biblical justice in our city. I want to challenge you and your family to prayerfully consider how you can jump into biblical justice and to impact our city. We're going to be jumping into that soon, so don't miss out. It'll also be part of our Bless campaign that starts in a couple weeks. Now, as we prepare for communion, we remember that we practice repentance and walk in faith and pursue justice because Jesus made us right with God through his death and resurrection. Remembering that centers us on the gospel. And it takes us from right versus left politics and reminds us what is important. So if you're at home, please take out your juice or whatever you're going to use for a, for a liquid and your bread. And we're going to take the, the Lord's Supper together. So if, if you have your bread, um, take that. Remember, his body was broken for you. And if you have your juice or whatever you have at home, Take that remembering his blood was shed for you. Every time we gather, we take that remembrance of him, his death, his resurrection, the hope that we have beyond what happens here, despite how crazy life gets here, that we live a life of repentance, we live a life of faith, and we live a life of justice. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being a God of justice for seeing us and loving us from the richest to the poorest and caring about our world and our part that we play in it. Lord, we pray um, as we go in our world, no matter what craziness is going on, that you open our eyes to see people and things the way you see them, to love people and to grow in our relationship with you. We're thankful for having uh, opportunities to uh, have church in uncertain times, to be able to connect with you and connect with other believers. And we just pray, Lord, as um, this, uh, this continues to go on, that we can connect with you more and more uh, every single week. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, hello, Five Oaks Nation. Pastor Love here with some incredible fog for you. This weekend story of Five Oaks Goodness is about a group of Five Oaks students with a mission to spread kindness. Sammy Ranweiler started the Kindness Crew at her school after being teased and bullied for wearing her deceased grandfather's shirt to school. She stood up to the bullies that day and then set out on a journey to start a club where everyone was welcome, accepted, and had a voice. Shout it from the rooftop, Sammy. We love it. Sammy wanted to help others who are dealing with or have dealt with difficult situations in their life that have left them feeling alone. Sammy asked her friend, Kaylin Carter, and her sister, Peyton, to help with making her vision a reality. The mission of the Kindness Crew is to spread kindness by helping others and setting a positive example within their school. Kindness Crew members are encouraged to promote a sense of kindness at home, school, and in their community to create ways to acknowledge students and staff for random acts of kindness and to inspire others to spread kindness by modeling positive behavior. And also, they, they host and participate in activities that focus on spreading kindness. Buckle up, because it gets even better here, folks. 
They have held several community events and fundraisers and have raised, get ready for this, $25,000 and probably more for local families in need and have hosted amazing events to promote kindness, awareness, acceptance, and understanding. I don't know about you all, but I want in and those shirts are awesome. I wear a size large, by the way. If you want more information, write Kindness Crew on your communication this weekend. Thank you, Sammy and Kaylin and Peyton for inspiring us all as we head into a season of taking steps to bless others as a church and as followers of Christ. What a great dose of inspiration. Stay kind out there, people. This is Pastor Love signing off from another great week at the Weekly Fog.